up now. You know we'll be the dog stand, stand up now. <laughs> Join us, the Eureka's Stockade Commemoration March. Grab, the, grab a banner, grab, get to the streets, take over. <laughs> Join us in the march. Reclaim the spirit of Eureka. You're a bit of a raving anarchist now, Jessica. What, what's, what's the situation? Well, actually me. I hardly ever go on anarchist marches these days. Mostly for my two issues, G oh. and D Sal. But D Sal, you've had a bit of a win there, would you say? Oh no, no, no. not really. Not really. They're not going to. They might if we de -sell. if the global financial crisis hits. Yeah. And the banks will collapse. <laughs> I Come mean, they've mocked the South Gold Coast one. They actually want to stop it running. Yeah, that's right. 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 Yeah, that's about having your asset seized. And this gives us an idea of what it was like in 1854, when people had no rights, no liberties. Some people would like to explain that the revolt is a, a small business revolt against mining licenses. And that's the reason we have extended the category of Eureka Australia Day Middle. Because there are people who reclaim that history every day by doing meticulous research, by going back to the early records, by keeping that spirit alive, by trying to stop people changing the history to suit their current circumstances. Now at the end of this, we will be marched or walking through the city to the town hall where the mayor, I think it's the last official duty, will be uh, raising the flag with our youngest member, Tarrant. I don't think Tarrant knows yet. And, uh, <laughs> And, uh, but uh, it's good that we've now come out of the wilderness into the tent and that we are now part of the official celebrations. So first of all, I'd like to call on Graham Walker to come forward first. Now, I, I just met Graham a few, about an hour ago. And I knew Graham's dad, Bob Walker. Bob Walk was a metal worker from Victoria who did what Helen and I didn't do. We came, we came to Melbourne, we came to Melbourne to get away from the Alton Peterson because we couldn't get work there because we were blacklisted. Bob had a bit more courage, he went up to work in Queensland and got blacklisted. <laughs> Good on you, Bob. Now, now Bob died. We offered Bob a Eureka Australia Day medal two years ago, but he gracefully declined. He was that type of <laughs> self-effacing. He was the type of militant and activist that worked all their lives but never received any recognition and never wanted any recognition. So now that he's dead, we thought we'd offer it to his family instead. <laughs> and his family's accepted. So, please say a few words about your dad. Um, okay, well, I, I think Joe said it all. And so, dad was a metal worker who... Um, who was involved in the rock and roll for a long time, and then after that he became an anarchist. Speak and, up, uh, Graham. I thought uh, what I'd do actually is um, read a little poem that one of the workers uh, uh, wrote about him. It's in the bag, so it'll take 30 seconds. So, so this is from uh, moving to Queensland and after being blacklisted in Victoria and then moving to, to Queensland and being blacklisted again. And uh, there was a shipyard there called the Evans Deacon Shipyard where they had a lot of stuff happening and that was involved. And it was, uh, uh, there was workplace struggles for safety and, and conditions, etc. But also these guys were um, interested in workers' control as well. So it was a very interesting kind of time. Yeah, this was in the 70s. And um, so 
really uh, this is a uh, one of the guys in, in the, one of the workers wrote this poem about that and uh, what happened to him. I thought this kind of says it all. So it's called Bob Walker, the 23rd point. The story I'm about to tell about a bloke you all know well, a union rep here on the job and known by all of us as Bob. He fought the causes on our behalf with his neck stuck out like a big giraffe. An upright man, he'd stand and fight and he knew the cause he thought was right. With dedication rarely seen, he removed the barriers in between and brought together as best he knew the boilermakers, ironworkers and the ANU. It's the union. But the United Front was not desired by the boss and so our Bob was fired. Our Bob they must have lived in fear as a lesser man would still be here. The metal trades then took a hand. You know them all with gallant band, that gallant band. In judgment sat with wig and gown a decision they then handed down. Guilty and without remission, Bob used the phone without permission. A dreadful thing for him to do, it serves him right well second too. And if unity you all are seeking, there's the metal trades in Evans Deacon. They work together at his job of sacking him, this man called Bob. So, this is an unknown poet uh, like this, I think, to very much. You can otherwise um, be so good about that. And, uh, I'm very proud to be here to accept this for him. Thank you very much. Look, those of you who all received the medal, the medals have actually been handcrafted by Bill Perry, who does it for nothing. Everybody does everything for nothing in this group. Nobody gets paid for anything. And uh, it's, uh, you may want to put Dad's name in the back because we're too cheap to put it on. Thank you very much. It's great to see you come to Queensland and the first time you're out Queensland. And it was an honour to know your father. We corresponded for about 20 years. And that was an honour. Now, our next recipient will give us the Ken Moon. Ken, please. You don't have to be polite to a recipient. They do. <laughs> Now, look, I, as far as the Eureka Australia Day medals are concerned, it's a nomination program. We believe somebody should receive one of these medals for what they have done and send in your nomination. I mean, Ken thanked me for nominating him. I said, I didn't nominate him yet. I said, other people nominated him. The thing is, Ken is one of those tireless, grassroots community activist that's in on everything that nobody ever hears about. He was nominated by the people of his suburb in Sunshine. And they sent in the nomination because they respect what he has done for the suburb and for the city of Melbourne. But you'll never hear the name Ken Mooney mentioned anywhere. You'll never see his name in history books. Not even as a footnote. <laughs> but Ken is the opinion of that tireless activist who gives their time, their energy, their money, their resources for the people around them and the community they live and work in. So I am proud for you to enter the handle for the Eureka Australia Day Medalist. And remember, Ken, next time you write to a troublesome bureaucrat, you write Ken Moody. E-A-M, <laughs> Eureka Australia Day Medalist. And if you don't do that, we'll re remove the medal from you. <laughs> well, I find today, and I find that, uh, excuse me today, that it's an honour to accept this medal, especially when it's from your own team. I find this medal is the highest honour in Australia and it's not just, I'm just not accepting it for me because if there hadn't been people working with me lots of things wouldn't have been done over, over my lifetime. So other people have believed in the struggle and the cause that we're fighting for because our cause is right, our cause is just and our cause is going to win. We're on the winning side, even though it takes taken a long time, and it take, it's taken my lifetime, I'm proud to stand with you people and stand today in what, what better place to see 
to receive the manor. And also, too, without an honour, my wife has always stood by me and the honours for her too because she might have gone to places that I've gone, but she stood side by side as partners in life together. And I thank her. And I thank everybody. We are on the right side and we will win. Thank you very much. We know who you are now, mate. I did answer the phone from yeah. could be somebody who's lost trying to find a place. So on behalf of the Anarchist Marine Institute and the Reclaim the Radicals for the Eureka Rebellion group, we'd like you to have that. And when they take you away, tell them you're a Eureka Australia Day medalist and they can't do anything to you. That's all that hasn't been done. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And this is for everybody. I think for everybody. Congratulations on your because when you come out and you hold the flag up that you can get shot for, that's, that's dedication. And I thank you on behalf of Australia. Now the uh, next medalist, just in case you think this is an all boys affair, is uh, Dr Dorothy Wickham. So would you like to step forward, Dorothy? Now Dorothy is a Ballarat legend. She is a Ballarat legend. Now what Dorothy has done it's a little bit different to what Eureka Australia Day medalists usually do. We're out there and get our head bashed in and we get nowhere. Murdered by the rebel two days before their rebellion was put down in the sea of blood. And Dorothy showed that it was a hoax. It never existed. Spin was as part of 1854 as it is today. And that headstone was removed through meticulous research. And those of you who've got the time, I'd like, and, and the guy was also involved in the Eureka Encyclopedia, and also lots of other research uh, regarding Eureka. And tonight, those of you who've got the good fortune, uh, you're all welcome to come along from Uncle Kenner in uh, Sturt Street. What we've got is Dorothy talking about the radical women of the Eureka Rebellion. Because the Eureka Rebellion wasn't an all-male affair, as we all think. And uh, she'll be speaking tonight at uh, 7.30, 7 got a 7 o'clock start. So if you haven't booked, don't worry. Turn up and we'll crowd out the restaurant. We'll find a seat for you. But it's people like Dorothy who do it for the love of it, not for the money, who do it for the love of it, who keep the spirit alive because they tell us the truth. They let us reclaim what we have. Because you've got to remember, the Ballarat Rebellion <laughs> was a rebellion which was caused shame in the city. For years, people tried to hide it. A little bit like being a convict. These days, being a, an ancestor of a convict is great news. The same with the Eureka descendants. So, Dorothy, I'm sorry I've took up so much time, but you've done so much work in this area that I just can't catalogue it. Well, I've read most of it, but not all of it. They didn't even have a first name. So uh, it was very important to put names to those women, especially, who were very important and significant around the time of Eureka. And I'd like to say how um, pleased I am to accept um, this medal. And I feel it's a great honour. And uh, there are very big similarities between the Papuan or the West Papuan struggle and the struggle at Eureka and I commend you and good luck. Good on you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much Dorothy and we look forward to much more exciting research and some uh, dirt tonight of the Eureka women. Thank you. Now <laughs> uh, the next two people are very elderly and they're from Queensland and obviously they can't be here. And uh, they're of the same vintage as uh, Bob Walker. And I was hoping Barbara Hart would come down from Queensland to uh, say a few words on their behalf. She uh, just retired 
Joe. What's that? She just knocked. She just retired. No, she just broke her arm. Oh, <laughs> that's why she can't come down. She sent a letter of apology saying that she's a fall, had a fall and uh, she can't come down. Now oh. these two people, I was talking to a bloke. Now his name escapes me. Mr. Jiggins. John Jiggins. John Jiggins. He's the author of uh, Cops Killed on Mackay, and we helped to launch his book a few, relaunch his book a few weeks ago. And him and Barbara uh, nominated Esma and Graham Garner. And uh, John Jiggins was a little bit upset because he's got his Asia record. He's only got one volume. <laughs> and uh, Esme and uh, Graham Garner have got seven volumes each. <laughs> so I said to John, don't worry. You've got another 20 years to get the next six volumes. So this is the type of activists they were. They fought during the most um, bitter times of the Bealtic Peterson regime when things like this couldn't happen in Queensland, when Alan and myself and the other older people from Queensland will remember what it was like. Three people was an illegal gathering. You had to get permission to march. And if you think it can't happen again in Australia, think again, because in the last 10 years, we've had a whole series of legislation which has been passed, which has been removed our rights and liberties to protect our rights and liberties. And we can do that in Australia because under the Australian constitutions, Australians have no legal rights at all, except pro possibly for a little bit of compensation if their land is compulsorily acquired. You have no rights to freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech. Uh, you don't even have the right to vote. The High Court had to tr go through the Constitution to find the implied right to free speech during an election campaign because you couldn't have free elections without free speech. So in Australia, unlike in Great Britain, which is uh, regulated to some degree by its association with the European Union and the United States of America, you have no rights. And any right that you have now can be legislated away tomorrow, and they have been. You can be picked up and jailed for up to 14 days and interrogated, and nobody knows where you are because you may have inadvertently have information which may assist the authorities in their investigations. And the list goes on and on, and we've seen how it happens and how, it, it is, how easy it is when there are no constitutional protection to human rights for a government with a mass media, you know, baying for blood, to pass legislation to remove those rights. So Esma and uh, Graham wrote back and he said that they were uh, uh, very happy to receive the Eureka Australia Day medal. He said that uh, Esma was very weak and very sick at the minute. And um, I don't know if you know any more, Bob, do you? Or yeah. maybe Bob could say a few things. Graham. Sorry, Graham, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Graham, my apologies. <laughs> He just, looks, he just looks like his dad, that's why I got mixed up. And the last time I saw his dad, he was uh, Graham's age. Yeah, well, yeah um, anyway, they're, they're, well, I don't know what to say, but they're, uh, they're okay, and, and I'm sure they'd be very happy to accept this. And um, my father and Graham have kind of been best friends for 40 years fighting this, uh, you know, against what's happening in Queensland, although they didn't always agree politically totally, but um, so. At the moment they're good, apparently, so I'm going to see them in the next couple of weeks. And so, they're just getting all that. Uh, Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks very much for that. Now, last but not least, we've got our own John Lawrence for Eureka Australia Day medal. Would you like to step forward, Mr Lawrence? Now, I consider John to be a lifelong friend. And there are very few people that you'd say that about. And the reason I consider John to be a lifelong friend, like many of the other people here, is that I know that if I am in trouble, that John would do all he could to assist. He is like those miners that we saw who fought today, 156 years ago, who stood by each other, not because they were related, not because they're of the same religion or the same nationality or spoke the same language, but because they believed in the same basic freedoms and rights. And John has been working with this group since 2002. He was our 
how shall I put it, our uh, token Ballaratian. Although he's not even from Ballarat. <laughs> and uh, he's worked tirelessly, not only for this particular group, but also for many other issues. Like, it was John's initiative which brought the West Papuan people here today. It's John, John's initiative which has seen us now being incorporated into the official celebrations. And he sits with me at these meetings once a month in Ballarat where we, you know, we uh, discuss what's happening for the next Eureka celebration. But the thing is, I think the important thing about John, that through his life, he has understood about injustice. He understands that, that old adage that, you know, you should treat people the way you would like to be treated. And if he sees injustice, he stands up and says, what he believes in. And I think he's a very worthy recipient of the Rika Australia Day medal um, this year. Yeah, well, thanks, Joe. Like I said, I'm uh, not 100% sure about the medal, but, but uh, yeah, I try, I try to question everything, scrutinise everything, and I even do that within my own peer group. And sometimes that puts me out of step with my peer group. So be it. There's been issues like the Republic that I haven't supported. Doesn't mean I believe in the monarchy. I believe it is because I believe that there could be others who are bloody using these issues. Not for our benefit, not for our greater good, but for the centralisation of power. I hope the idea of centralisation of power. They could even be talking to the, the dissolve of the states and uh, regional governments. Goes to my support for the people of West Papua. Rather than centralising the power in Java, if people seek independence and they have the right to be independent, it goes to the people of Scotland being independent from bloody Britain. It goes to the people of Ireland who got their, through their struggle, got their independence. So I hate centralisation, and I've always fought against that, and that and justice are the two main things. Good on you, mate. Thank you very much, John. You don't get away. Every child with these a prize. Thank you. Now, look, I just, before Taryn does the uh, Eureka Road, where are you, Taryn? Yoo-hoo. She's run away, has she? Right. Now, I'd like our... Hey. One of our Papuan friends to come here. Uh. Come on, Jacob. And I'd like you to te teach Jacob the Eureka up. And if you two do, could do it together for us, because I think they begin to understand how important it is to us, and, and they're as important to us as we are to them today. We've become brothers and sisters. We swear by the Southern Cross. We swear by the Southern Cross. To stand truly by each other. To stand by our each other. Truly each other. And fight to defend our rights and liberty. And fight to defend our rights of right of liberty. We'll do it once more. Big slow. All right. We swear by the Southern Cross. We swear by, by the Southern, Southern Cross. To stand truly by each other. To stand, stand truly, truly by each other. other. And fight to defend our rights and liberties. And fight to fight defend, to defend, defend our, our rights and liberties. And liberty. Very good. Here, here. We'll be moving off in about five minutes, so have a, a break at, to um, the town hall, and uh, there'll be opportunity for people to speak there, and the flag will be raised. And uh, it's great to see you all here. Some familiar faces, some new faces. But the important thing is that you work with who's here, and hopefully you'll bring somebody else next year because uh, I think it's something we, we'll continue to do. So we'll have a, a break for a few minutes and then we'll continue on. We have uh, worked well with you. Uh, you've been very open-minded. You've welcomed us into the camp. We only have one complaint, a very simple complaint. And if you're mayor next year, what we'd like to see is the Eureka flag flow on the main flagpole of the Ballarat Town Hall to make it complete, because in the 156-year history of Eureka, it has never been flown from that main flagpole. But we appreciate the fact you've taken your time from the election on Monday to come here. 
to raise the flag and say a few words to people. So thank you very much. Thank very you. good. Thank you, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this morning. Eureka continues to be a significant part of Ballarat and Baptist Nation's history. As a council, we take very seriously our role in ensuring that the story of Eureka continues to strengthen from day to day. The new establishment at the Eureka Centre, the $11 million new uh, interpretive centre, will be a strong um, symbol of the Eureka and all of the debate that surrounds the story of Eureka. The flag, for the first time, is not in Ballarat. It is away being restored in, uh, in Adelaide. We have a role to play in making sure we preserve and restore all of our parts of our history and heritage. We know that's why people make choices to come to Ballarat, because of our history and heritage. And so our responsibility that the council takes, we take very, very seriously. So on this day today, we should remember that there were lives lost. And so we have a right and a responsibility to acknowledge that and to honour that and to um, pay our due respects to the activities and uh, the issues surrounding the Eureka Rebellion and the Stockade. So it's my honour and my pleasure to be able to join our new generation and be able to raise the flag together. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Let's go, Carl. for your poem The Names of the Diggers this, guy, this mate of mine he says they always talk about the 22 who died but what were their names? John Hines, County Clare, Ireland Patrick G Gittins, County Killarney, Iron, Ireland Thomas Mullen Samuel Green John O. Robinson Edward Thonen from Prussia, John Haffeli from Württemberg, John Diamond from County Clare, Thomas O'Neill from County Kilkenny, John Donaghy, County Donegal. Okay, this William Clifton, native of Bristol. Okay. Edward Quinn, from County Cairn. William Quillian, Quinlan, from Goulburn. William Emmerman, from Hanover. Leo Ross, from Canada. Thad Moore, County Clare. James Brown, from Newry. Robert Julian, from Nova Scotia. Wow. Someone Crow from Scotland, someone Fenton from England, and Edward McGlynn from Ireland. Uh, in other parts of Victoria. So the, these are not just the ones who died. There's at least another 20 that are buried 
different cemeteries across Victoria who died of wounds later on. But 22 of those men were put in coffins and they were carried 24 hours later from the place where we had the dawn ceremony this morning to here. And you've got to remember, it was not an easy journey. These were defeated people. The army had come into Melbourne, another 800 troops had come in overnight from Melbourne under uh, uh, Colonel Nich Nicholson, I guess, Nicholson or Nicholson. And so they were occupied people. So on that journey from the Ballarat field to here, the streets were lined with armed troops. So they had to walk down between those armed troops with their comrades in coffins, which were laid here in a mass grave. Four people were buried at the Eureka site, and they were disinterred three years later and brought here and reburied with their uh, comrades. And the thing about this monument is is that it was erected within two years of the rebellion by public subscription. It was put together by uh, stonemasons who came down from Geelong, who came across from Geelong to build the monument. And it's quite extraordinary, isn't it? Here we are on the 3rd of December, and there isn't even a Eureka flag flying. Here's, a, here's one here. Yeah. Yeah. Just a flag that's loose, you've tied that one up. Well, you can see if they have a loose one. Come over there. Yeah. Oh, there it is. <laughs> little logistical issues here. It will clip through. It's a clip? No. no oh, it's it's another bit. Okay. Keep going, Joe. I'm interested in this story. I don't perform for cameras. Oh, oh very good. <laughs> uh, we know about the revolution, don't we, Joe? Can't be televised. I, I'm, I mean, it's my ears too, you know. It's not the camera. Very, very good. Okay. It should never be taken down. That's right. Yeah, a nice stainless steel one. <laughs> There's a metal worker talking for you.
jail for having a morning star flag. Symbols is what unites us. That's why the Eureka flag as a symbol is so important. So for them to raise a flag which wasn't a British flag on British territory was an act of high treason, just high treason. And that's why it was significant. That's why at the end of the battle, the Trooper King raced up and grabbed the Eureka flag. Captain Ross from Canada had his guts spilling out of his abdomen on the ground. He was carried away to the Eureka Hotel and died there a few hours later. I mean, he died for the flag. Not for the flag, but for the cloth. But what it symbolises. People forget when they say, I am willing to die for a flag. It's not the piece of cloth what it symbolises, what the Eureka flag symbolises in those twin aspects of human existence which are friends in this culture, and our involvement and struggle for freedom and democracy, the ability to determine their own affairs about external coercion. That's what that symbol was for them. Extraordinary uh, moment, really. We come here. I think Margaret is proud. And again, 156th anniversary. Who else has been here? It's a mark of that sacrifice. I know it's a long time ago. When you think of the fourth flag in Australian folklore, in Australian history, in the Australian trade union movement, even in the Australian white supremacist uh, groups, you think of that. You think of that importance. It's quite extraordinary. There's nobody. Well, Sunday is Sunday. Sunday is Sunday. Today is the day that it occurred. That's the whole point. I know there'll be people here on Sunday, and I know there'll be people here on Saturday, and I know there'll be people in fancy uniforms marching up and down on Sunday. But to us, we don't come here to reenact anything. We come here to celebrate what that flag meant to these people and what it means to us today. That's what we're here for. And I'd like to ask Jacob to say a few words, because as I said, 1854, 2010. Different country, same struggle, same principles, same ideas, same concept. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's the first time I'm uh, speaking. Um, on behalf of the people of West Papua, also Maluku and Kanaki, we are proud join with you and uh, for solidarity because today uh, we are standing here because I believe that uh, we have a concern to continue um, the matter already dead for uh, liberty, freedom. Also, they give the life to change the world. Um, I believe that they did, well, what they did is uh, have the deep meaning to us, what they did is have a big meaning to us, because they stand to tell the world that human is human, the right is right. So they said enough is enough to colonial to my story doing crime against humanity crimes against freedom because each people individual family group and the nation they have the right to life the 
right of freedom, the right to develop the culture, economy, education, and no more. That means they give the life for all. Today we stand in here special for uh, West Papua we land. We also already lost around 546,000 pounds killed and disappeared. And then we remind, remember that before us, that gentlemen, they already did well. They tell us that we never surrender. We should struggle to change the world. We start from ourselves, individual, family, our neighbor around us. It's come to the nation. Um, Regional, regional, and of course, it's, it will go into the world. Thank you very much for our gentlemen. Also, the children died. We learn from them because by them we stand today to look the future. is not one can buy with money. Thank you very much for com com committee organize this uh, basic event because we must perform we learn from you and we share our each other because future is our responsible together to start today because that's not you United Nation not government, but the start from us. Once again, thank you for all of you, because you stand in here, although this a big sun, but I believe that you stand in here because you have noble heart. Thank you and God bless you. We all talk to our people the feel Jacob himself can understand what it is like to be shot Personally, it's not just an intellectual thing. Mine's just an intellectual thing. Unfortunately, I've been shot by somebody else here has, has that, that bond with freedom fighters. Have. Now, if anybody else would like to speak, and then after people have spoken, those of you who want to, I know some people have moral objection, walk down to the uh, soldiers' graves. Because I'd just like to remind you that. Half of the soldiers and the police who were involved in the uh, stockade battle were Irish. Half of the people in the stockade were Irish. The thing about a colonial mentality is it doesn't, it doesn't care who it uses to put down people. And it's, uh, it's one of those ironies of the Irish rebellion. There are two brothers, one on one side and one on the other side. The ones on the Eureka side uh, convinced the other brother to desert they get into the gold fields to get out of the to the land a few months later. So there's all these little personal issues. I mean, these weren't extraordinary people. These weren't super men and super women. These were people like us. These were very difficult problems. Our family assets, problems with kids, relatives, neighbours. These were ordinary, ordinary people. Edward Fenon, 22, lemonade salesman, humble occupation. He sold lemonade on the golf course to the Marnies. Went through to all the pits and would ask somebody if they want a glass of lemonade. Ordinary people who found themselves in the midst of an extraordinary event in this country's history, which was still quite so extraordinary. If anybody else would like to take the stand, please say what's on your 
mine, yeah. and then we'll go across to the soldiers. <laughs> just arrived. We did we left Melbourne at uh, 8.30 I think this morning and uh, we just couldn't make it for all the program and uh, but just standing here it makes one, one feel proud to be an Australian. It's funny that uh, we celebrate uh, death in this way but this is a particular important occasion in Australia's history because these men, as our friend from Papua New Guinea, who is in this particular country, is going through absolute turmoil to think that they can't even raise a flag without being shot at. It's just an absolute disgrace that a country as lovely as Papua New Guinea can't live a peaceful life. in some way when we cool down in the new year and support this lovely country and you can see this man is of high quality and uh, he should be supported with his other people. But getting back to this particular monument, as Joe just said about the lemonade salesman, I'll, I, what, I'm only reading on the, the Eureka and what I can read and pick up is most of these people were not miners, they had a pick and shovel and they just sit out because they thought that they could open up their lives in a new country. And they went to the minefields and just followed each other in the hope of finding some gold. Now we know finding gold is very, not easy to get up from. And it's very hard to find gold in the gold fields. And all I say is that these men, that they, they wanted a prospect for gold, they had the the government making it more difficult with the restrictions on their mining licenses, increase the prices, etc. And of course they formed the rebellion. What we should do in Australia now is, it's sad that none of us, you particular people, but the, the Australian nation is not anywhere near behaving like these men, 22 men killed here behave. We ought to be ashamed of the way we're behaving as a nation because we've kowtowed down and, and we're, not, we're not thinking about the country and all I'll say to you is the Aboriginal people are starting a new political party and I think that we should look at this we should look at this and, and support them because somehow or other we've got to get this nation free and progressing as it should be as a nation it's going to take a long time and probably not in our lifetime but it's the Aboriginal people are the one who might be to make a difference to how this nation performs in the future. I'll finish by saying that it's a privilege to be here with my partner, of course, and, and uh, I'm just saying to you, I know a lot of you people here, over the years we've met at different things, different functions, different protests, and I would say that we're very privileged indeed to have a leader in the anarchist movement, Dr. Joe Moscano. We're very lucky to have a man like this because he's a true Australian, knows Australian history, and he preaches what he, he preaches what he practices. And I, I would just say, like to say, thank you very much, Joe, for this, and, and, uh, and enjoy the rest of the time. I think we'll have a nice time today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This monument and the enclosing fence were erected in uh, 1,000, what was it, 1,879, if my Latin's right, for the government to record at the request of the citizens of Ballarat. It was the other way around. The government came here and was so disgusted by what, by the fact that the citizens of Ballarat had made no uh, effort, and they actually asked for the businesses to uh, raise some money to uh, do a good thing. If you look at this, 
you see on the other side, if you come in, you look on both sides, it's, it's about duty. It's always about duty. It's not about freedom. It's not about but it's about duty. Duty. If you come to this side and you read the plaque, and this is where all monuments are political spin. In this place, with other soldiers and civilians, and remember, the little drummer boy is no longer here because he actually wasn't killed. I did mention that this morning. On the military camp that in Ballarat were buried, and you'll notice that Ballarat is on a misprint, had two L's and two A's in those days. Were buried the remains of the British soldiers, Henry Christopher Wise, who was the captain, the deputy commander of the Canadian Force, Michael Rooney and Joseph, Joseph Wall, Private of the 40th Regiment, and William Webb, Felix Boyle, and John Paul, Private of the 12th Regiment, who fell dead or fatally wounded at the Eureka Stockade in brave devotion to duty on the third of, on Sunday the 3rd of December 1854 whilst attacking a band of band, a band of aggrieved diggers in arms against what they regarded as a tyrannous administration. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see the battle of the get, monuments. It gets better. Admission. It gets better. <laughs> not far not far west from this spot lie the remains of some of the diggers who fell in their courageous but misdirected endeavour to secure the freedom which soon afterwards came in the form of manhood suffrage and constitutional government in big letters. Because remember, this monument was established 21 years after the other one. And they were very aggrieved that they said it was an unconstitutional government. So it's, uh, I mean, that's the nature. The interesting thing is... Misdirected. Misdirected. Yeah, misdirected. Yeah. But the interesting thing is... Exactly. The six soldiers who are very only one died on the day. Five died of their wounds within two facilities, no antibiotics, gangrene, infection, all that issue. So if you remember, there were 22 bodies found on the day. As I said, many of the diggers were taken away by their friends from the battlefield because they were concerned because they were being slaughtered and massacred on the day. And many of them would have died of their wounds. And of the 120 people in their stockade, less than 60 survived. That's how ferocious less than 60 survived. The interesting thing was at the 50th anniversary of the uh, rebellion, there were lots of people who said they were Eureka diggers who turned up for the celebrations. It's very interesting. And the last digger who died, who died in New Zealand in 1923, turned out to be a fraud. I've actually done an article on him. He said he was, a, he was actually Eureka, but he actually he never he was a six-year-old boy, but he, he lived on that, uh, on that story. It's very interesting. What I'm saying, the names of things, yes. they don't have the names. <laughs> they actually have the names of those that but are very the there. On the others, yes, on the they do. They have the names of those that are buried there. Oh, okay. But not the names of those that were taken away and died. So, Nobody knows. So no one knows the names. No. Yeah. So we don't... We have no full, full record. But if you can see that one died on the battlefield, the other five died of wounds, you can imagine what would have happened to the people who were wounded on the battlefield. Yeah. So, but again, misdirected. Constitutional government agreed the tyrannous battle goes on a so, And the propaganda battle goes on till today. Because if you think John Howard in his administration and and the, uh, the historical revisionist claim was a uh, a revolt by small business people about licenses. Because it's not there, but it's not the only people who just want to radical change to talk about the essence of the universe. Now Mr Mooney, he ain't here wants to say a word. Our family, my family, <coughs> my uh, great-grandfather was sergeant at Carlton Police Station. He was Irish and uh, he was one of the hundred coppers that went up to Glen Rowan to, uh, to grab the Kelly Gang. And other, it wasn't just the Kelly Gang, because he went out, I think it was two to three hundred people that were going to join him and fight. But he came back and he finished up an alcoholic. But the story of this, we pop up from everywhere. We're like, we're not weeds, we're like budding flowers. We pop up everywhere. It's some was a staunch trade unionist 
and he was he was a, a shearer. And there was a boat called the Rodney coming up the Murray River to uh, to scab. And a group of unionists, which my grandfather was one of them, blackened their faces and their bodies with grease and swum out to belt the scabs up. Not only did they belt the scabs up, they sunk the Rodney. So what I'm saying is we pop up everywhere. <laughs> in our family. That's right. That's the beauty of family history. That's right. <laughs> Very good story. There's people you acknowledge and people you don't acknowledge. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I called my, uh, my great-grandfather an Irish rat. And he was. But whether becoming an alcoholic was trying to forgive himself, I don't know. But I still call him an Irish rat and I've got the big photo of him at home and it's all glass, it's his wedding and it's been kept in the family and I treasure that. I always say to people he was a he was an Irish rat anyway, thanks. <laughs> See when you look at history, you look at things which are acceptable today were a stain. Australians were always considered by the British aristocracy and if you look at history like I have, they had a stain on their character, they had a convict stain and families fought tooth and nail to ensure that any convict ancestry was removed from the family records. Today you create a convict ancestry because it makes you feel as part of the community. It's the same with being Indigenous. Families had to hide being indigenous in order to survive and have their children taken away. Today, it becomes more acceptable to be indigenous. Today, the descendants of the Eureka uh, rebels have their own little group and they have their own little dinner on Friday night and they do their own little thing. But 50 years ago, even 50 years ago, it was a stain to be involved with this movement. So it was time things change. And they don't change because somebody says it's time to change. They change because people say, well, you know, it's time to change our attitude to this because it's not right. Why should I have a stain because my ancestor was a convict? Why should I be any different because, you know, I've got, se I've got a different sexual orientation or whatever. And that's the beauty, I think, of the, of the 21st century is that we are overturning a lot of these things. But it's not the state individuals banding together to do it. But if you look at all the early convict stain, and the worst ones were the Tasmanians. Because most of them were convict descendants. That's why we have all these Tasmanian jokes. And that's where the Tasmanian joke came from, the stain. You know, that you weren't quite human but you had this convict ancestry. Hey, the Irish were a stain, Joe. Well, yeah. you weren't much of a stain. You, you worked for the British authorities pretty good. Oh, 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 getting contentious here oh, now. Three of them were Irish. Oh, oh. Three of those boys there were Irish. Yeah. Raised in Belfast, this yes. Redcoat Regiment. Yes. And it was their first engagement, right? They were sent to the colonies. They was raised specifically for the colonies. They'd never fought before. And they fought bravely. Yeah? They didn't know what was going to happen. Right? So, Irish boys. And I want to say, it doesn't carry through in the blood. Yeah? Just because you're a child of Eureka means fuck all. Yeah? <laughs> it's like daughters of the revolution. Fuck all, unless you're at the barricade. Yeah? That's where Eureka That's spirit true. lives. In resistance. In looking to the future. In working together. Yeah? Building community and building resistance. That's where Eureka res spirit resides. Well, some people want to package the spirit into a commercial entity and you sell it from a storefront. You buy your Eureka spirit, right? Some people want to dress in fancy uniforms and reenact the battles. You know, some people, as you say, want to say that the only people who can have the spirit of the direct genetic descendants. And that's why when we first started this in 2002, we were looked again, we were looked at quite uh, with disdain. Because what we are here is to reclaim the spirit, the essence, the process. We don't care where you're born. 
what you do is, Graham said, what we care about is the fact that you care enough to come today and it's meaningful enough for you to come to this town today to show your respect and to take this into your life. And that's what counts. That's why we're not in fancy dress. That's why we're not selling Eureka flags. And that's why that's just the way it is. And that's why we're so dangerous. <laughs> I reckon I'm fancy dressed. <laughs> <laughs> it might look like we're in fancy dressed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right there. Well, so here's the rebel. <laughs> well, we've got a long walk back. Some of you will want to go in a vehicle. We're going to go back to the park. We're not going to go by the gallery. And hopefully the, our Italian friends will have a play to entertain us while we have a late lunch. And I'd just like to encourage you to come to the uh, dinner tonight. If you haven't booked, don't worry. Just wander in and we'll find a spot somewhere. I'll uh, book for 30. Hopefully 30 will turn up. If they don't, bad luck. I hope 50 turn up. And Dorothy's an entertaining speaker. But the interesting thing about Dorothy is that she's done the hard yards. I steal other people's research, but she actually has done the real research, gone to the original sources. So that's good. I just glean my stuff from other people's research like Graham does. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're too busy doing this. Too busy organising. <laughs>